In today's lesson, we are going to talk about Raycaster. The Raycaster is one of the classes that are in this library and used to know the elements that are behind the mouse pointer, almost like the hover in the CSS. The idea behind the Raycaster is that you are casting a ray, and from this ray, you can know the elements that interacted with the ray. Or instead of interacting with the ray, here they are using intersect. So each element intersect with the ray, I will have an access to that element, and thus I can do any changes to that element. So let's see how we can use the ray caster. First, I have to instantiate the ray caster. So I want to go after the renderer section and create the ray caster section, and then creating the ray caster by writing constant ray caster is equal to a new 3.raycaster. So this is was the first step to create the raycaster. The next step is to create an event listener, and the event that I'm going to use is the mouse move, but the values must range from negative one to positive one. And this process is called normalizing, and we talked about normalizing before. In general, it means that a values range at a range that I already know. In this case, I will make the values range from negative one to positive one. So the mouse coordinate on the x-axis must range from negative one to positive one, and the mouse coordinate on the y-axis must range from negative one to positive one. And I want to save these values inside an object as we did in the lookat lesson. Here we have another way to do that, which is by creating a vector two and saving these values inside of it. So I can save inside the vector two two values, and then I can reach the first value inside the vector two by using the dot x, and we can reach the second value inside the vector two by using the dot y. And if the vector was vector three, then I can reach the third value by using the dot z. Okay, now let's create the vector two by writing constant pointer is equal to a new three dot vector two. And then I want to create the event listener by writing window dot add event listener. And as we said, the event that I'm going to use is the mouse move. And then we do the anonymous function. Pointer dot x is equal to e dot client x divided by window dot inner width. Now the mouse coordinate on the x will range from zero to one. So when I multiply it by two, the values will range from zero to two. And when I subtract one, the values will range from negative one to positive one, and we do the same on the y. We change the dot x to dot y, and the client x to client y, and the width to height. But now, when I move my mouse up. The value will decrease, and when I move my mouse down, the value will increase. And we want the opposite. We want the mouse coordinate on the Y to increase when I move my mouse up, and decrease when I move my mouse down. And that will be done by putting a minus here, and it changes the minus to plus. So now the values will range on the X from negative one to positive one. And on the y, the values will range from negative one to positive one. Okay. So first, I created the raycaster, and then I created the event listener, and saved the values inside the pointer variable. The third step is to cast the ray depending on the mouse position and the camera position, and the ray direction will change depending on the mouse direction. And that will be done by creating a casting ray section. Raycaster. Dot set from camera pointer and the camera name as we name it here. So we write camera. And the last step is to specify the elements that I want to listen to in case an intersection happened 
between these elements and the ray. So we write constant intersects is equal to ray caster. In case I want to listen to one element, then I have to write dot intersect object. Then inside the parentheses, we specify the element name. But in case I want to listen to multiple elements, then I have to write dot intersect objects. And then we do an array, and inside this array, we specify the elements. I want to listen to these two cubes, so I will write their names inside the array. The first cube name is mesh, and the second cube name is mesh2. Okay, let's apply the intersects inside the console to see what we will get. First, I will get an empty array, because there is no intersection between the array and any mesh of these two meshes. So since the mouse or the array did not intersect with the elements that I specified inside the array, I will keep getting an empty array inside the console. But once I point with my mouse to one of these two meshes, then the element that I was pointing to will be printed inside the console. If we want to see the type of information that I got from pointing to this mesh, we notice that we have a distance, which is the distance traveled by the ray before it reaches the cube. The face that the ray intersected on, point coordinates, UV coordinates, and from all this information, I'm only interested in the object, which is the mesh. So inside the object, we notice that we reach the geometry. And to the material, position, the mesh rotation, and the scale. Okay, now I want to change the mesh color if there is an intersection, which is the same example that we have in the documentation. So here they are iterated depending on the number of elements intersected with the ray, and they accessed the intersected element by using the dot object, and then they changed the intersected element color by writing dot material dot color dot set, and inside the set they passed the new material color. So I want to do the same by copying this code and paste it here. Okay, let's arrange our code and put these two meshes inside an array. And then write the meshes array here. Now when I point with my mouse to one of these two meshes, the mesh color will change to red. Okay, now I want to do the hover effect. I want to change the mesh color in case there is an intersect and if there is no intersection, I want the mesh to return to its original white color. But before we do that, I have to know something, which is that the ray will penetrate all the elements that are in its path. So if I open the console and start hovering the first mesh like this, we notice that we have an intersect for only one element, which is this first mesh. But when I start rotating like this, and then start hovering the same mesh, we notice that we have two intersected elements. And the reason for this is because what we said before, which is the ray will penetrate all the elements that are in its path. And this lead to coloring these two meshes. Cause the code written here will color all the intersected elements. So these two meshes will be colored. So to get the same hover effect that is in the CSS, we have to fix this problem. And that will be done by creating an array and call it one intersect mesh. And inside this array, I want to save only the first element that intersected with the ray. So if I rotated the camera like this and then hover this mesh, then I want to save inside the array only this mesh. And if I hovered on the other mesh, then I want to save inside the array only this mesh. And that will be done by writing if intersects dot length greater than zero. And that means that in case I have elements inside the intersects array, I want you to push only the first element that is inside the intersects array to the one intersect mesh array. Because always the first element inside the intersects array is the first element that I pointed to with my mouse. 
So in the first case, when I rotate my camera like this, and then I point to this mesh, we notice that inside the console, we have two elements. Always, the first element of these elements will be the first element that I pointed to with my mouse, which is this mesh. And in the second case, when I rotate the camera on the other side, and then point to this mesh, the first element inside the intersects array will be this mesh. So based on that, I want to push the first mesh inside the intersects array to the one intersect mesh array. But we have another problem, which is, in case I print the one intersect array inside the console, we notice that every time I move my mouse while hovering the mesh, it will continue to push the first intersected mesh inside the one intersect mesh array. I want to push the first element that is inside the intersects array to the one intersect mesh array only once. And that will be done by writing if one intersect mesh dot length is less than one, I want to push the first intersected mesh. So here I said that when the intersect mesh array length is less than one, I want to push inside of it the first element that is inside the intersects array. And this condition will be true in case the one intersect mesh array was empty. So when the one intersect array is empty, the first element inside the intersects array will be pushed inside of it. Okay, now under the condition, I want to write one intersect mesh zero dot object dot material dot color dot set red. And that means that I want to color the first element that is inside the one intersect mesh array with a red color. So this condition will be executed in case I have elements inside the intersects array. That means that we have an intersection between the array and one of the meshes that I specified before. And in case I don't have any intersect, else if, but we also still have an element inside the one intersect mesh array, so the first element that is inside the one intersect mesh array is not equal to undefined, therefore, I want to return its color to the white. Okay, now when I start hovering with my mouse on one of these meshes, the condition that will be executed is this condition. Why? Because we have more than one element inside the intersects array. And thus, the intersects array length will be more than zero. And then when the one intersect mesh array is empty, meaning that the number of elements inside the array is less than one, I want to push the first element that intersected with the array, and then change the color of that pushed element to the red color. Else if, in case there is no intersection with the array, meaning that the intersects array length equal to zero. And that will happen when I start moving with my mouse like this and did not point to any of these two meshes, but I still have an element inside the one intersect mesh array and that element got pushed by this line of code. Thus, we still have an element inside the one intersect mesh. The first element inside the one intersect mesh will not be equal to undefined, so I want to turn this mesh color into the white. So the purpose of using the if else here is to turn the mesh color that has been colored by this line cause of the hover into another color when we stop hovering. And the last thing we have to do is to write one intersect mesh dot shift so that we remove the only element that is inside the one intersect mesh array. And once we point with the mouse to another element, this element will go through all these stages. Okay, let's try now the hover effect. The hover effect works fine on the two meshes. Let's try now when we hover the two meshes at the same time. Excellent, everything works as expected. And of course, I don't have to tell you that you can do more than color changing. For example, you can animate scaling the mesh by using GSAP. We want to scale up the meshes to 1.25 on the X, Y, and Z, and when we stop hovering, I want to return the meshes as it was.
and that will give me this animation. So that was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. Our lesson for today is one of the most interesting lessons, and it is about how we can deal with 3D models. As we know, that one of the main features of using 3GS is to display 3D models on the web. In case we want to use a simple model, we can use the geometries that this library offers. And in case we want to use models that are more complex and have a lot of details, then we have to use one of the 3D software such as Blender. So in this lesson, we are going to install Blender and start learning the basics of Blender software. But we won't go into Blender detail since this course is about 3GS. Okay. First, we want to talk about the 3D file formats. We have a lot of common 3D file formats, which are formats specially for 3D files. And each format exists to solve a specific problem. And these problems can be the file size. So we need to use a format that is light in size, because we want to upload the model on the web. Also, we have several types of formats because each format will contain a specific data type. Compression, some of the formats can be compressed and the others can't be compressed. Copyright, etc. So now we want to start learning two formats that are usually used on the web, which are the GLTF format and the OBJ format. Let's start with the first format, which is the OBJ format. In order to upload an OBJ file on the web, we have to see the OBJ loader. Here they are telling us that the OBJ file contains data format representing the geometry. And this data is simple and we, us, a human can read it. And this data contains the vertex position, the UV coordinates, normal coordinates, and also the face that forms the geometry surface. Meaning that it almost contains the same data that is inside the 3GS geometry. And here they are explaining to us how to use the OBJ loader. But before we do that in practice, we have to know that when we load the OBJ file, the material type is mesh fung material. And as we know, that we need lighting in order to see this type of material. Okay, to use the OBJ loader, first, we need to have a 3D model. So that's why we are going to download Blender software and use one of the demo models that are inside the software. So the first step we have to do is to go to Google and write Blender. And then select the Blender.org link. Then we click on Download the Blender. Since my operating system is Windows, so I'm going to install the Windows version. And if you don't use Windows as an operating system, you can select the operating system from here and then click on the download button. Then Blender will start downloading. After it has finished downloading, we click on the file. Click Next. Check Next. Next. Install. Then Blender will start installing on the device. After the installing finished, we click on Finish. Then we move to desktop and double click on the Blender file. Okay, this is how the Blender interface looks like. Currently, I'm working on the 3.2.2 version. And even if you don't have this version, don't worry, Blender basics will be the same. This list is about creating a new file. And just like any software, which is that you can create a new file from more than one place. So you don't have to create the file from these options. Okay, here we have open option in case you have a Blender file and you want to open it. Here in case you are working on older version, then you can recover that version. In the recent files, you can open the files that you were working on. Here they are telling us about the features of this version and what are the updates and changes to this version. Okay. We left a click anywhere outside this interface so that will make it disappears. The basic scene for any Blender project will consist of cube, light, and camera. And we also can find these elements inside the collection. 
So we can choose any element, whether by moving to the element and then left click, or by choosing the element from here. Okay, first we want to remove the light and the camera, because we are going to add the light and the camera from our project from 3GS. So I select the element that I want to delete, then we press delete from the keyboard. Now the light is deleted from the scene and also deleted from the collection. And we do the same on the camera. In order to see the scene more clearly, we press the wheel on the mouse and then we move the mouse. Then we will start rotating like this. In 3GS, the red line is the x-axis and the green line is the z-axis and the blue line is the y-axis. In Blender, the red line is the x-axis as same as 3GS. But the green line here is for the y-axis and the blue line is the z-axis. Here the colors will help you remember the axis location. If we want to move the cube, then we press G and then select the axis that we want to move the cube on it. If I want to move the cube on the x-axis, then we press X. So now I can move the cube on the positive X and on the negative X. Press left click if you want to move the cube to this location. And if you didn't like this location and you want the cube to back to the previous location, then you have to press Ctrl and Z. So in case you move the cube several times, each time you press Ctrl and Z, then the cube will back to the previous location. In case while moving the cube, you suddenly decided to not move the cube, you can press right click. Then the cube will return to its pre-moving position. Okay, so as we said, that if we want to start moving the cube on the x-axis, then we press G and X. And if we want to start moving the cube on the y-axis, then we press G and Y. And if we want to start moving the cube on the z-axis, then we press G and Z. If you want to be more precise in moving the cube, then you have to press N so that you show the transform panel and then move to the location. Here you can start moving the cube in the position you want, whether on the x-axis or in the y-axis or in the z-axis. Okay, this is all what we have to know about how we can move an object. Also, we can scale the cube by pressing S and then select the axis that you want to scale the mesh on it. If we pressed X, then we will start scaling the mesh on the X axis. If we pressed S and Y, then we will start scaling the mesh on the Y axis. And if we pressed S, and Z, then we will start scaling the mesh on the Z-axis. And of course we can scale the mesh from the transform panel. Also we can rotate the cube, so if we press R and X, then we will start rotating the cube in this direction. And if we pressed R and Y, then we will start rotating the cube in this direction. And if we pressed R and Z, then we will start rotating the cube in this direction. Okay, now we want to delete the cube and add one of the demo models that are in Blender. So select the cube, then press delete, then press shift and A. We have a lot of options, but I'm only interested in the mesh. We can add a plane, cube, circle, sphere. I want to choose the monkey mesh. Now I want to export the monkey as an OBJ format. So we go to file, then to export. Here you can select the format you want. We want to select the OBJ file 
and then we specify the file location. And you can name the file with any name you want. Then we press on export. Go to the static folder. I will create a new file and I will name the folder models. Then we put the exported file inside the models folder. Now as we saw in the documentation that in case we want to upload an OBJ file, we have to use the OBJ loader. And the loading process will be through the load method. And inside the load method, we have to specify the file location. And also we have to write the callback function. And inside the callback function, we can specify what we have to do with the model after it has been loaded. This function will be automatically executed after the model is being loaded. And inside the callback function, we can write any name. And this name will refer to the monkey mesh. So, we want to add the monkey mesh inside the scene. We also can use another callback function, and this function will be executed when the loading is in progress. So in case the file size was large, then the model will take several seconds until loading the model. We can do some styles inside the HTML and CSS, such as a div covering the entire screen. And after the model is loaded, we can remove these styles from inside the progress function. So in this formula, which is xhr.loaded divided by xhr.total multiply by 100, the percentage while loading the model will be printed inside the console. And the last thing, you have a function that you can write inside of it the things you want to do in case you have an error. So let's now apply everything we have learned. First, as we saw, we have to use the OBJ loader. So we have to import it by writing import OBJ loader from three examples JSM loaders OBJ loader. And now we want to instantiate the loader by writing constant OBJ loader is equal to a new OBJ loader. And anywhere below the OBJ loader, I want to create a loading model section and then write OBJ loader dot load. And inside the load, we specify the file location. So we write models slash Suzanne.obj. And then we write the callback function. And I want to name the model object. And inside the callback function, we add the model inside the scene. Of course, we can see the mesh. Because as we said, that the default material for any OBJ model is mesh fong material. And this type of material needs lighting in order to see it. So, I want to create a light section. First, I want to add the ambient light. And then I want to create the directional light. And I want to move the light on the z-axis to make the light face the mesh. And the last thing to do is to add the ambient light and the directional light inside the scene. Then the mesh will look like this. Now as we saw in the documentation, that we can easily read the OBJ file, and we also can modify the file. So if we double click on the file, we will notice that the OBJ file contains a lot of written codes. And the line job depends on the first character written in the line. So in the first line, the first character is V and the letter V is an abbreviation for vertices. And these numbers represent the location of the vertices in the 3D space. So if we try to change these numbers, then the shape of the mesh will change. So all these numbers that start with the letter V are for the vertices position. The numbers that start with the letter of VT are the UV coordinates for these vertices. And VT is the abbreviation of vertices texture. 
the numbers that start with the letter Vn are four vertices normal, and the normal coordinates will tell you where these vertices are facing. So in this case, we position the light in front of the monkey mesh, approximately here. So the face that are in the front must be brighter than the face that are in the back. If we didn't write the normal coordinates correctly, we would not have a realistic scene. For example, it might make this part of the mesh brighter than this part of the mesh. Or incorrect normal coordinates might lead to making the back side bright even if it is not facing the light, and the front side dark. So, the vertices normal will make the mesh more realistic. Okay, the numbers that start with the letter F is to describe these faces. These numbers are representing the vertices that formed the first face. And these numbers are the numbers that formed the second face. But since we are using 3D software, we don't have to go into more detail. So these are the types of information that are inside the OBJ file. Okay, as we said that the default material for any OBJ file is the mesh fung material. So if we want to make sure that the material is the mesh fung material, then we have to print the object inside the console. Open the console, then we will notice that the object is a group. And as we said previously, that the group is like a big box and contains several types of elements, such as the meshes. Okay, but why the console told me that I have loaded a group, but we have exported only the monkey mesh? And the reason for that is when we create any mesh by using a blender, the blender by default will put the mesh inside a group. But our mesh will be inside the children. So this is the monkey mesh. And the material is the mesh fung material. And since we have reached the mesh, then we can apply everything we have learned before. So we can move the mesh by moving the whole group like this. Or we can move the mesh like this. In this example, there is no difference in moving the whole group or moving the mesh. Because the group contains only one mesh. But in case I separated the mesh into two meshes, the face mesh and the head mesh. So if I move the meshes as a group, then both meshes will move one on the y-axis. But in case I moved only the first children, as I did here, so depending on the order of the meshes, only the first mesh will move. Okay. We also can change the mesh type. Currently, the mesh material is the mesh fung material. And we can reach the mesh material by writing object dot children zero dot material. So if I printed this line inside the console, then inside the console, we can see the material type. We can change the material type by equaling this line with the new material type. For example, if I want to change the material to mesh basic material, then we have to write a new 3 dot mesh basic material. And I want to choose the red color. And now, if I print the object again, we notice that the material became mesh basic material. And of course, we can change the material type to any type you want. And inside the object, we will notice that the material became mesh normal material. Okay, this was the first type of a 3D model format. Now let's see the most used format, which is the GLTF format. The GLTF is an abbreviation of GL transmission format. This type of format covers most of our needs and also works perfectly with 3GS. The GLTF format supports different types of data, such as geometries, materials, cameras, lights, scene, so we can add a whole scene, we can also add animations as we will do later. The GLTF format comes in two formats. In the first format, the file will be a JSON file, and the format will be a GLTF. And in the second format, the file will be a binary file, and the format will be GLB. 
and in both formats, we will be using the GLTF loader in order to load these files. Okay, now we want to open the Blender and export one of the demo models as a GLTF and export it again as a GLB. Open the Blender and then delete the default scene, press Shift and A and then choose the Monkey Mesh. Then we want to export the model by going to File, then go to Export and we want to choose the GLTF. As you can see that the GLTF format can be a .GLTF and a .GLB. So by selecting this option, we can export the mesh as a GLB or as a GLTF. So select this option and then choose where you want to export the model. So select the static folder and I want to export the model inside the models folder. First, we want to export the file as a GLB file, which is the default as you can see here. And I want to name the file monkeyglb.glb. Okay, now we want to export the same model, but this time we want to export it as a GLTF file. So we have to choose GLTF embedded. And I want to name the file monkeyglf.gltf. Now if we go to the models folder, these are the two files that we have exported. The GLTF file size is 92 kilobyte and the GLB file size is 68 kilobyte. And these files contains the same model, but the GLB file size is less than the GLTF file. So that's why I prefer to use the GLB format. Okay, open the project and then choose the GLTF model. As you can see that the GLTF file is a JSON format and the file contains the mesh properties and also contain information about the mesh, such as the vertices, UV, normals, faces, and material encoded in a JSON format. And the GLB file contains the same information, but the information is encoded in a binary file. Okay, let's now comment out the OBJ model. And now we want to load the GLB file. As we said that we load the GLTF file and the GLB file by using the GLTF loader. So in the same way we have imported the OBJ loader, we want to load the GLTF loader by writing import GLTF loader from three examples JSM loaders GLTF loader and then we instantiate the loader by writing constant GLTF loader is equal to a new GLTF loader and then we use the GLTF loader to load the model by writing GLTF loader dot load then we specify the file location and I want to load the GLB file then we write the callback function till now all the steps to load the GLB file are similar to the way we loaded the OBJ file, but the only difference is by adding the model inside the scene. In the GLB and GLTF files, we add the model inside the scene by writing scene.addglb.scene. In the OBJ file, we added the model directly without writing .scene. But in the GLB and GLTF formats, we have to write .scene. And that's because in the first case, the OBJ loader will return 3.group. Then we can add the group class directly inside the scene. But when I load the model by using the GLTF loader, then the return value will be a GLTF type. And the GLTF have a lot of properties. So when I write a dot, we notice that we have animations, asset, cameras, parser, scene, scenes, user data, and the group mesh is located inside the scene. So if we write console.log glb.scene, we notice that we have reached the group. And this group contains one children, which is the monkey mesh. The default material of the GLB and GLTF file are the mesh standard material. And as we know that this type of material needs a light in order to see it. Okay, currently we are loading a small size model. 
But in case we have uploaded a large size model, then the user will spend a lot of time in order for the model to be loaded. So that's why we have a special class that compresses the geometry and thus the size will be reduced. And the class name is the Draco Loader. The Draco Loader is a loader used to load a compressed geometries. So the geometry must be compressed in order to load it using the Draco Loader. Okay, open the Blender and I want to create a mesh. Then in the first case, I want to export the model without compressing it. And I want to name the file 1.gltf. And now, I want to create the same mesh, but this time, I will compress it. And that will be done by going to the geometry, and then check the compression option, and I will stay on the default compression level, which is 6, because if I increase the compression level, we might have a change in the geometry shape. Then I want to change the file name to 2.gltf. Then we click on export. Go to the models folder. We notice that the file size before the compression is 92 kilobyte. And after the compression, the file size became 20 kilobyte. If the file size is larger, you will notice the big difference in size. Okay, let's know how we can load a compressed model. If we try to load the compressed model, which has a name 2.gltf, then we will have this type of error. No Draco Loader instance provided. And that means that we have to use the Draco Loader. So the first step to load a model using the Draco Loader is by importing the Draco Loader. By writing import Draco Loader from three examples JSM loaders Draco Loader. Then we have to instantiate the Draco Loader, but we have to instantiate it after the GLTF file. By writing constant Draco Loader is equal to a new Draco Loader. Inside the static folder, we have a folder called Draco. And this folder contains two files the Draco decoder and the Draco wasm. We have to tell the Draco Loader the path for the Draco file. So we write Draco Loader dot set decoder path. Then we specify the Draco folder location. And the last thing to do is to give the Draco loader access to load the GLTF file, and that will be done by writing GLTF loader dot set Draco loader. Then we write the Draco loader as we name it here. Then the model will appear, but the model size is smaller than the previous model. So now the GLTF loader can load the compressed models, and also can load the uncompressed models. Okay, this is all what we have to know about how we can load a compressed model. Now in case you want to load a new file format that we didn't mention in this lesson, then you can load the model in two ways. The first way is by importing the model inside the Blender, and then export the model in the format that you want. Now I want to import a .obj file, and I want to export the model as a GLB file. Then we can import the model in our project using the GLTF loader. So this was the first solution, which is by converting the file format. The second way is by using the loader that can load the file format, as we did when we used the OBJ loader to load the OBJ files. All these loaders are made for a specific type of format and you can import them in the same way as we have imported the OBJ loader and the GLTF loader, because all of these loaders inherits from the same class, which is loader class. Okay, let's see the next topic, which is how we can do animation and how we can display animated model. To create animation, we have to use the Blender software. Open the Blender, and I want to animate this cube. So remove the light, and the camera, the part responsible for any animation is the timeline, which is this part. So put the mouse on the edges of the timeline bar, and then press left click, then pull to the top, so that we can see the timeline more clearly. Okay, 
Then I want to specify the number of frames to 60 frames. So the animation will start from the frame number 1 to the frame number 60. Click on the cube. Then three things will appear here. The location, the rotation, and the scale. We move our mouse to any of the location options and press I. And we move our mouse to any of the rotation options and press I. And we do the same thing in the scale by pressing I. Then we move the timeline bar to frame number 30. Then we have to decide where we want to move the cube in the first 30 frames. I want to move the cube on the Z by a value of 2. And rotate the cube on the X, Y and Z by a value of 180 degrees. Also, I want to change the scale value for the X, Y and Z and give it a value equal to 0.25. After we finished, we go anywhere inside the location and press I and anywhere inside the rotation and press I and anywhere inside the scale and press I and then we put the timeline bar to the last frame. Then we select the first frame by clicking and drag to make sure that we have selected the first frame. We copy Ctrl and C then we paste Ctrl and V so that the cube returns to the same position in which it started. But I want to do the same changes to the cube by changing the value of rotation on the X, Y and Z and making it equal to 360 degrees. Then we press I. Now we press the space bar in order to see the animation. And if we pressed the space bar, the animation will stop. I want to return the timeline bar to the first frame because I want the cube to look like this when I import it into our project. Ok, let's now export the model and I want to export it as a GLB file. Then we specify where we want to export the file. And I want to name the file animated cube. Now the first option that I'm interested in is inside the include, which is selected object. This option will only export the models that I have selected it. In the transform, we have only one option, which will make the top direction is the Y direction. So always make sure to check this option. And also make sure that you have checked the animation option, so that we have the animation with the model. Then press export. Now go to our project. And then I want to load the model which has a name animatedcube.glb. This is the model that we just exported. As you can see that the cube size is large. So I want to reduce the cube size by moving the camera back. Or by scaling the cube by writing glb.scene.scale.set. And I want the scale to be 0.25 on the X, Y, and Z. Then I will have the same result. Okay, now if I console.log GLB, we notice that the animation is inside the animation array. This is the animation that we just did. Any animation here is called animation clip. And the animation clip is one of the three GS classes. And to display the animation, we have to use another class and the class name is Animation Mixer. Here they are telling us that we can use the Animation Mixer class in order to play the animation on the models. Okay, we go to our project and write constant Animation Mixer is equal to a new 3 dot animation mixer. The Animation Mixer class accepts the root object which is the object that we want to play the animation on it, which is the glb.scene. So we write here glb.scene. Now we said that we want to play the animation on the model, which is the glb.scene. And now we have to specify which animation we want to play, and that will be done by using the clip action method. So we write constant clip action is equal to Animation mixer dot clip action. Then, as we said, we have to specify the animation. So we write glb dot animations zero, and that will play the first animation inside the animations array. 
So here I printed the GLB. Then we wrote dot animations. So we go inside the animations array and choose the first animation inside the animations array. So that's why we wrote zero. Now we want to play the animation. So we write clip action dot play. And the last thing to do is to update the animation mixer on each frame. So we want to update the animation mixer inside the animate function. But we don't have access to the animation mixer variable outside this function. Because as we know that the functions will do something called local scope. And to solve this problem, I want to declare the animation mixer variable outside in the global scope using let. And equal it to null, so that we can know that this variable will get a value. Now I want to remove the constant. So now I give the animation mixer variable a new value. And now we can use the animation mixer variable inside the animate function. Now inside the animate function, I want to create update animation mixer section and then write animation mixer dot update. Now inside the parentheses, we must pass the difference between the current frame and the previous frame. Because as we know that the animate function will display an image in each frame. So I want to know how much it took to move from the previous frame to the current frame. Then I want to pass that time inside the update so that the displayed animation will be equal to the image rendered on each frame. And we can calculate that time by going anywhere outside the animate function and tell him that the previous time equal to zero because we currently didn't display any image. And then we will go inside the animate function and once we reach this line of code, the elapsed time will start calculating the time since we have entered the site or the project. So I want to subtract this time from the previous time. And I want to save this value inside a variable. Then I want to change the previous time value and make it equal to the elapsed time. For example, assume that the elapsed time value is 0.002, then the frame time value will be 0.002 minus 0, which will be equal to 0.002. Then we changed the previous time value to the elapsed time value, and that will make the previous time value equal to 0 0.002. The next frame will be called once we reach this line of code. Assume this process took another 0.002 seconds, then the elapsed time value will be equal to 0.002 plus 0.002, which will be equal to 0.004. So this is the new value for the elapsed time. And then 0.004 minus previous time, which has a value equal to 0.002, is equal to 0.002. So the new frame value will be equal to 0.002. And again, this line will equal the elapsed time value to the previous time value, and so on. In this process, I'm interested in the frame time value, which is the time between the previous frame and the current frame. So if we printed this time inside the console, we notice that this time value is very small because as we said that this time represents the time moving from the previous frame to the current frame. So I want to use this time inside the update. Then we got an error because if we print in the animation mixer inside the console, we notice that the animation mixer variable value will be null for a fraction of a second. And that's because we reassign the animation mixer and give it a new value inside a local scope. And as we know that the code inside the global scope will be executed first, then the codes inside the local scopes will be executed according to the order of the lines of code. First, we give the animation mixer variable a value equal to null in the global scope. So that's why firstly, we got a null inside the console then we give the animation mixer a new value inside the local scope. So that's why after we have got null, we start getting the new value we gave to the animation mixer variable. 
and to solve this problem we have to write if animation mixer and then we write the code we want to execute inside this condition because as we know that the codes inside the if statement will be executed in case the condition is true so as long as the animation mixer variable value is null meaning the value is false the code inside this condition will not be executed and when the animation mixer value became not equal to false meaning the value became true the code inside this condition will be executed then I simply will put the animation mixer dot update inside this condition and thus finally will give us this animation okay so this is how we can do and display a simple animation but in case you want to do a more complex animation then you need to use one of the websites that will allow you to create a complex animation and the site name is Miximo.com this site is owned by Adobe and it provides many services that will benefit us so first you have to create an account on this website the registration process is very simple and will not take a lot of time after you finished registering here you have two options which are the characters and the animations in the characters option you can choose the character you want and then in the animation option you can choose the animation you have a lot of animations so you can choose the animation that will fit your need okay after choosing the animation and the character click on download button in the format option we notice that we have a lot of fbx formats i want to choose the binary with scan if you want to download the animation with the model and if you choose without scan then you will download only the animation we want to choose with scan with 60 fps then we click on download after the file has been downloaded we want to put the file inside the models folder now as we saw that the file format is fbx and as we said that we could import it inside the blender and then export it as gltf or glb format so this is the first way to import the file into our project and the second way is by using the fbx loader so we write import fbx loader from three examples jsm loaders fbx loader then we create the fbx loader section and write constant fbx loader is equal to a new fbx loader and here i want to change the loader to fbx loader then we write the file name as we name it here the return value is fbx here we write the model that i want to apply the animation on it so we only write fbx without writing dot scene because if we console.log fbx we can see that we have reached the group meaning that the fbx format is almost similar to the obj format here we change the glb to fbx here we change the glb.scene to fbx and then we add it inside the scene as fbx then the model will look like this but as you can see that the model size is so large so we have to modify the scale value and change it to 0 0.01 on the x y and z also i want to move the model down on the y axis and increase the light intensity so that we can see the model more clearly okay all that we have learned will allow us to create a simple web application but in case you want to create a game on the browser then we have to design the game character and then add multiple animations to the character as we can see on the maximum website we are limited to certain characters and on each character we can add only one animation so let's see how we can solve this problem 
This problem can be solved using the Mixima website. We can add the model here, but the model must stand in a T pause position, meaning the model will stand like the T letter. So we go to Google and then write T pause 3D model free download. Then we will have a lot of websites that will give us free models stands in the T pause position. And the downloading process is easy and simple. And then you can choose the format you want. But before downloading any model, make sure that the model is licensed. We will use the model that is inside your startup folder. And the file name is tpause.glb. So I want to open the Blender and import the file which has a format .glb. Then click on Import. Okay, now if we pressed shift and depressed the mouse wheel, we can move inside the blender scene like this. Okay, this is the model that we want to use in our project. Go to the shading bar and activate the shading viewport by pressing on it. And this option will show the textures on the model. Then we want to export the model in FBX format. And we want to name the file tpause.fbx. Now go to Mixima website and then choose the upload character option. From this option, we can upload the model on this website. But the model format must be in one of these three formats, which are FBX or OBJ or ZIP. Click on select character file, then choose tpause.fbx file. After the upload has finished, we click on next. And now, we want to place these circles on the correct part of the character, as shown in this image. After finishing, we press next. Then the rigging process will start and it might take several minutes. After the rigging process is finished, they will show you the model doing a random animation so that you can know if the animation works correctly or is the animation consistent with the model. If you want to redefine the circles, then press back and if you want to continue, press next. Okay. Now the model is ready and now we want to choose the animation. I will choose the animation which has a name Orc Idle. Click on download. Then choose the FBX binary with skin 30 FPS with no keyframe reduction. Then we click on download. The file name after the download is finished is orcidle.fbx. Now we want to open Blender and I want to import the file that we downloaded from Miximo. Press G and X so that we can move the animation. Now when I press the space bar, we notice that the animation works here. But the animation has no texture. So I want to transfer only the texture from this model to the animated model. So I want to go to each mesh inside the textured model and add the texture on that mesh to the same mesh in the animated model. And we can find these meshes inside the armature. And these are the meshes that I want to add the texture on it. The armature is the part that will do the animation and the meshes are replaced on the top of the armature. If you want to see the armature, then you have to go to each mesh and press hide. This is how the armature looks like. Okay, now I want to add the textures by going to the first mesh that is inside the armature and then clicking on it 
The orange line will show you the mesh location. Then go to the material properties and click on it. Then click on the arrow. Now these are the materials that are in the animated mesh, and it have the same material name that are in this model, and that's why they automatically added OO1 beside the material name. So we choose the material that is inside the textured mesh, which has the same name, but without the OO1. We finished the first mesh, then we move to the second mesh and do the same. We select the material which has the same name, but without the OO1. And we do the same on all meshes. Now after we finished, we select this model, and then delete it. We only want the animated model. Now we have one textured model, and the model contains one animation. And now, we want to add another animation to this model. And this process will be done by using a specific tool, and this tool is called Miximo Add-ons. We can install this tool by going to Google and search for Miximo Add-ons. Then we select the link substance3d.adobe.com and click on get the add-on. Then a compressed folder will start downloading. After the downloading is finished, we move the compressed folder to the desktop. Now inside the blender, we go to edit and select the preferences, add-ons, install, then specify the compressed folder location and press on select add-on. Now we search for Miximo, then we check the Miximo rig. Now we want to back to Miximo to select the second animation, and I want the animation which has a name Magic Attack 4. Click on download. But I want to change the skin to without skin. This option will allow us to download only the armature without the model meshes, because we already have the meshes. This is the second animation file, and we want to import it inside the blender. The armature will do this animation. Now we press N, then we go to Meximo. This is the add-on tool that we downloaded. Click on the armature that is inside the textured mesh, and then select Create Control Rig. Now we can add multiple animations by clicking on the eyedropper, and then selecting the armature. Then we click on Apply Animation to Control Rig. And now, inside this model, we have two animations. Now the animations will not be arranged inside the mesh meaning that the first animation number inside the animation array might be 0, and the second animation 3. Animations arrangement is not part of our course topic, so we will not go into animation arrangement. Okay, now we want to delete this armature, and then export this model in the GLB format. I want to export the file inside our project, and name the file newmodel.glb. But before we export, I want to check some of the options, such as selected objects, transforms, apply modifiers, and the animation option. After we check the options, we click on export. Now we want to return to the project. Since the file is glb, then we need to use the gltf loader and we write the model name as we name it. Here we write glb.scene. Here we write glb. Here we write glb.scene. We don't have to use the scale. And we add it inside the scene as a glb.scene. 
This is the first animation. And I guess the second animation number is 3 or 4. Okay, now we want to talk about how can we improve the model. The first problem we have is about the light distribution on the model. We notice that the light reflection on the top of the model is very bright. But at the bottom, the brightness of the colors is lower. This is because the light intensities in 3GS operate on a principle called arbitrary scale unit, which simulates the intensity of light by default. But we can make the light's behavior more physical by going under the renderer and writing physically correct lights is equal to true. And now, even if I increase the light intensity, the light reflection on the model will be more realistic. So this is the first step to improve the model. And the second step is by changing the color gradation from the renderer. And that will be done by changing the output encoding from the linear encoding, which is the default, into the sRGB encoding. The third step is to get rid of the aliasing on the model. But before we do that, let's change the background scene color so that we can see this aliasing or the steps more clearly. We can change the scene background color in many ways. The first way is from the renderer by writing renderer.setClearColor Then we specify the color and the opacity. Now each time we reduce the opacity, the scene background color opacity will also be reduced. And if I make the opacity value equal to zero, then the scene background color will be transparent. And this white color is the body color. This will be proved by changing the body background color. And if I changed the opacity value to 0.5, then the scene background color will be a mixed color between gray and the purple. We also can get a transparent renderer background color by writing inside the WebGL renderer object alpha true. Now the purple color is the body background color. Also we can change the scene background color by changing the canvas background color. So choose the way you want to change the scene background color. Okay, we changed the scene background color in order to see the aliasing or steps on the edges of the model. We can get rid of this aliasing by writing anti-alias true. Now if we zoomed in, we notice that the steps disappeared. So these are the steps that will improve the model. So that was everything for today and see you in the shaders section. In today's lesson we will talk about shaders. From the beginning of this course we kept talking about the main function of shaders which is putting each vertex in its position and then giving each vertex a specific color. And since we are using the 3GS materials, we will automatically use Custom Shaders Program, which is the Shaders Program written by the 3GS library team. But in this section, we will write our own Shader Program. So first, we need to understand what we mean by shaders. The shaders are one of the main components of WebGL. The shaders are a program written in GLSL. The GLSL is just like any language, but it is similar to the C language. Any GLSL program will be executed in the GPU. The shaders will do two main things. The first thing is putting each vertex in its position and coloring each visible pixel in the geometry. For example, in this plane geometry, we have some pixels inside of it. The shaders will color only the visible pixels inside the plane geometry and ignore the pixels that surround the geometry, because there is no reason for coloring them. Okay, but how do the shaders work? First, we send data to the shaders program, and this data can be 
vertices coordinate, which is the vertex position. The data also can be the mesh transformation. So in case we move the mesh to the top by a distance equal to 1, then we have to move all the vertices up on the y-axis by a value of 1. Also, we can send the camera information as a data. So in case we move the camera on the z by a value equal to positive 1, then the camera will move away from the center of the scene by a value of 1, and thus the mesh will look smaller. Or in case we increase the field of view value, then the mesh will look smaller. And if we decrease the field of view value, the mesh will look bigger. Also, we can send the color as a data, so we can give each vertex a specific color, or you can color all the vertices with the same color. You can send the texture and the light as a data, and also you can send other types of data. And as we said, that all of this data will be executed through the GPU. Okay, we have two types of shaders. The first type is the vertex shader, which is the shader program responsible for replacing each vertex in its correct position. And the second type is the fragment shader, which is the shader program responsible for coloring each visible pixel on the geometry. So, the two types of shaders are the vertex shader and the fragment shader. The vertex shader will put each vertex in its correct position. First, we have to write the vertex shader program, and then we send data to this program. And this data can be the vertices position, the mesh transformation, and the camera details. And then the GPU will execute what has been written inside the vertex shader program by putting each vertex in its position. Each vertex will go through the vertex shader program separately. So in case we have four vertices, then the vertex shader program will get executed four times. Some of the data that is sent to the vertex shader might have similarities between it and the data of the other vertices. For example, we have this plane geometry, and this geometry contains four vertices. In case we decided to move the mesh one to the right, then this change will be applied to all the vertices. So the first vertex will move one to the right, then the second vertex, then the third vertex, and then the last vertex. After drawing a triangle between every three points, the mesh will look like this. And in case, this time I decided to move the camera to one on the right, then the vertices will move one to the left, and the final look of the plane will be like this. But why are the vertices moved to the left when we move the camera to the right? Because if we take a look at this example, you can notice that when I move the camera to the right, the vertices or the mesh will move to the left. And that's what exactly happened in our example. Okay, so the data, such as the mesh transformation and the camera information, this type of data will be similar to all of the vertices. And this type of data is called uniform data. And there is some of the data will differ from one vertex to other such as the vertex position. Each vertex will have a different position in the 3D space, and this type of data is called attribute data. Okay, so we have two types of data. The first type is the uniform, which is when the data will be similar to all the vertices. And the second type is the attribute, which is when the data will differ from one vertex to another. Okay. So when all the vertices are replaced, then the GPU will do some calculations, and from these calculations, the GPU will know which pixels are visible and which are not. And this information will be sent to the next shader, which is the fragment shader. So let's know what is the fragment shader. The fragment shader is a program written in GLSL. Also, we can send data to this program, and this data will be used in the fragment shader to color every visible pixel in the geometry. We can send two types of data to the fragment shader. The first type is the uniform data. And as we said, that this data will be the same for all the vertices. And the second type of data is the varying data, which is the data being sent from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. But what do we mean by that? Okay, so the first data type is uniform data, which is the data common with all the vertices. We can send this type of data directly to the fragment shader, 
and since the uniform data is the same data for all the vertices, then the geometry will be colored with the same color. And the second type of data is the varying data. The varying data is the same attribute data that we sent before to the vertex shader. And thus, the varying data is data will differ from one vertex to another. But the only difference between the varying and the attribute data is that we can send the attribute data directly to the vertex shader. But in case we want to use the attribute data in the fragment shader, we can't send it directly to the fragment shader as we did in the vertex shader. If we want to use the attribute data in the fragment shader, first, we have to send the attribute data to the vertex shader program as attribute data, and then we send it to the fragment shader as varying data. Okay, so the bottom line of the lesson is that if the data is uniform, then we can send it directly either to the vertex shader or to the fragment shader. But in case the data type is an attribute, then we can send it directly only to the vertex shader. But in case we want to send the attribute data to the fragment shader, first, we have to send it to the vertex shader as an attribute, and then we send it from the vertex to the fragment as varying data. And since the varying data is data differs from one vertex to another, then the mesh will be colored by different colors. For example, the first vertex color will be green, the second vertex color will be yellow, the third vertex color will be gray, and the fourth vertex color will be red. So, do you think that the mesh will be colored like this? And the answer is no. Yes, each vertex will have a different color, but there will not be an instant change in color between each separator of these four separators. Let's call this separator A. As you can see, that the color on the left of the A separator is green, and the color on the right of the A separator is yellow. As you can see, that there is an instant change in colors. There is no color gradation, and that's not how the mesh will be colored. There will be a color interpolation between each separator, and that will make the mesh looks like this. Okay, this was an introduction to shaders. Before moving to the next lesson, I hope you will review this lesson again, because the next lessons will depend on this lesson. That was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we will write the first shader program by using a specific type of material. So let's see what is this type of material. Go to the documentation and search for material. These are all the materials that we talked about before. And as we said in the previous lesson, that if we used any of these materials, these materials will use the custom shader program, which is the program written by the 3GS developer team. This program will position and color all the vertices. But in today's lesson, we will write the shader program by ourselves. And this will be done by using any of these types of materials, which are the raw shader material and the shader material. The only difference between these two types of materials is that the shader material contains automatically written codes. But in the raw shader material, we have to write the shader program from scratch. We will use the raw shader material so that we can practice writing the shader program. Okay, the first thing we have to do is to change the mesh basic material into raw shader material. So now we have to write the vertex shader program and the fragment shader program. So move to the source folder. We want to create the shader folder by clicking on create new folder. And I want to name the folder shaders. And of course you can name the folder with any name. Now inside the shaders folder, I want to create the vertex shader file and the fragment shader file. And as we said, that the shaders program are programs written in GLSL. Okay, let's create the vertex shader by going to the new file and name the file vertex.glsl and then create another file and name it fragment dot gl cell. Now as we said in the previous lesson, that the vertex shader program is responsible for replacing all the vertices in their position, and the fragment shader is the program responsible for coloring all the vertices. And now, 
I want to tell the raw shader material that this is the vertex shader program and this is the fragment shader program. And that will be done by moving inside the raw shader material and as we used to do, when we want to specify a value to the property, which is to specify a value to the property, we create an object. The first property name is the vertex shader and this property accepts the vertex shader GLSL code and the second property which is the fragment shader and this property accepts the fragment shader GLSL code. Now let's back to the raw shader material and draw the first property which is the vertex shader and then we want to pass the second property which is the fragment shader. Now inside this backtext, you can write the shader program inside of it, but the code will not be organized and also you may mistype the code. So that's why we created these two files so that we can write the shader's program with these. And all we have to do is to point to these files, which is mean that the vertex shader contains the code written inside the vertex.glsl file. And the fragment shader contains the code written inside the fragment.glsl file. So since these files are external files, which means that they exist outside the script.js file. So to use them inside the script.js file, we have to import them, just like we have imported the CSS file. So we write import, and then we give the file a name, and that name will refer to the vertex shader file, and I will name the file vshader. And then we specify the file location. Now since the shaders folder and the script.js file both exist inside the source folder, then I can reach from the script file to inside the shaders folder by writing dot slash. If the shaders folder was located outside the source folder, then we have to write dot dot slash. Now as you can see that I got outside the source folder and became beside the node modules and the bundler and the static. So we write dot slash. Then we move inside the shaders folder. Then we choose the file that I want to import, which is the vertex.glsl. And in the same way, we import the fragment shader. So we write import. And then we give the file a name. And I want to name it f shader. Then we specify the file location. And now we can use what we will write in the vertex.glsl file from inside the script file by using the vshader. And we can use what we will write in the fragment.glsl file from inside the script file by using the f shader. Now we move to the vertex shader property and then we write vshader. And here we write f shader. So now we can write the shader code inside these files. Okay. In order to write the shader programs, we must learn the GLSL language. So let's learn the GLSL basics. GLSL stands for OpenGL Shading Language. And the way we write this language is similar to the C language. GLSL is a strongly typed language. And the JavaScript is a weakly typed language. And the difference is that in JavaScript, we declare the variable using var or let or const. So to create a variable in the JavaScript, first, choose one of the declarations in JavaScript, and then we give the variable a name, then we give the variable a value, and this value can be a string or integer or float. So the variables in JavaScript can contain any types of data, and the reason for that is that the JavaScript is a weakly typed language. But in GLSL, because it is a strongly typed language, we have to give the variable a type. So I want to save an integer value inside the variable, then we have to use int. And if we want to save a float number inside the variable, then we have to write float. And if we want to save a boolean value inside the variable, then we have to write bool, meaning that we have to know the value that we want to save inside the variable. In GLSL, we have to write the semicolon at the end of each line. And if we forget to write it, then we will have an error inside the console. So the first thing you have to do when you encounter an error inside the console is to make sure 
that at the end of each line, you didn't forget to write the semicolon. We can use mathematical operations in both languages, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But in the GLSL, the variable types must be the same. So if we want to get the sum of the num1 and num2, in the GLSL, we notice that the num1 variable type is a float, and the num2 variable type is integer. And I want to put the sum of these variables inside the num3 variable, but the num3 type is a float. So any mathematical operations that happen inside the num3 variable must be a float type. And to solve this problem, we have to change the num2 type into a float. And now the num3 variable value is equal to. In the GLSL, we have the vec class. The vector is a class just like the integer or the float or the bool. The vector class is almost similar to the vector in the 3JS. The vector will allow us to save values inside of it. If the vector is vec2, then we can save inside of it two values. And if it is vector3, then we can save three values. And if the vector is four, then we can save four values. So if we want to create a vector2 variable, then we write vec2, and then we give the variable a name, equal vec2, then we specify the two values. Now the two values variable contains two coordinates. The first value is the x value, and it equals two, and the second value is the y value, and it equal four. If we created a vector2 variable, and we only specified one value, this value will be the x and y value. So the x value equal one, and the y value also equal to one. We also can change the vector values. In this example, we can see that the x value equals one, and the y value equals two. We can change the x value by writing num.x is equal to three. And we also can change the y value by writing num.y is equal to four. And now the x value became three and the y value became four. The vector three works in the same principle as the vector two, but in the vector three, we can save three values and we can reach to the first value or to the x value by writing nums.x and to the y value by writing nums.y and to the z value by writing nums.z. We have two ways to reach the values inside the vector three. The first way is just like we did before, which is by using the x, y, and z. And the second way is by using the RGB. So when I write nums.r, the return value will be one. And when I write nums.g, the return value will be two. And when I write nums.b, the return value will be three. So we can get the first value inside the vector three by using the x or r. We can get the second value inside the vector three by using the y or g. And we can get the third value inside the vector three by using z or b. We can create a vector three by using a vector two. So in this vector two, we have two values, which are the 0.5 and one. Then we can create a vector three by using the vec2 name and then adding a value so that we can have three values. We got the first two values from the vector two and one value that I added, which is the one. We also can create a vector two by using a vector three. So if we have this vector three, then I can create a vector two by writing vec2 nums is equal to 3.xy. And now the nums variable is a vector two and contains two values, which are the one and two. If you want to make the vector two value equal to one and three, then instead of writing dot xy, we write dot xz. Then the nums variable value will be equal to one and three. In case we write dot yx, instead of writing dot xy, then the values inside the vec2 nums variable will be 2 for the x and 1 for the y. And the last vector is the vector 4, 
with the same principle of the previous two vectors. We can save four values inside the vector 4, and we can reach the values by using the x, y, z, and w, or by using the r, g, b, a. In any vector, we can save multiple types inside the vector. In this example, I save two types in the vector, which are integer type and the float type. And we can also specify the value type that we want to save inside the vector. For example, if we want to save only integer values inside the vector, then we have to write i before the vector. So in this variable, we can only save integer values. And in case I want to save only Boolean values, then we have to write b before the vector. The if statement in the GL cell is similar to the if statement in the JavaScript. If the condition is true, then the code written in the A line will be executed. And if the condition is false, then the code written in the B line will be executed. The difference in the functions between the JavaScript and the GL cell is that in the GL cell, we have to specify the type of the return value of the function. So if the function will sum two integer values, then the return value will be an integer. So instead of writing a function, we have to write an integer. Then we call the function inside the num3 variable, so the num3 variable value will be equal to 3. And in case we have a function that does not return any value, then we have to write void. In case we have parameters inside the function, then we have to specify the type for these parameters. So in this function, since we want to return a value, then we have to specify the type of the return value. And since we are summing two integers values, then the return value type will be an integer. So that's why we wrote here int. But how did you know that we are summing two integers? Because inside the parentheses, I specify the type of the parameters to int. Okay. We also have built-in functions that we will talk about them in one of the upcoming lessons. This was the basics of the GLSL that will help us to write the shaders program. Let's see what the vertex and the fragment shaders consist of. Okay, now the vertex shader and the fragment shader contains base code. In the HTML, the base code will automatically be written when I use the emit tool. The HTML base code contains the main HTML tags, such as the head tag, body tag, meta tag, etc. And each tag has a specific function. In the shaders, we also have a base code. So we have to write the base code for the vertex shader and the fragment shader. So let's see what the vertex shader and the fragment shader base code consist of. We want to start with the vertex shader program. The vertex shader program is a program responsible for putting each vertex in its location. The vertex shader base code consists of four lines of code and the function that will send to the GPU to execute it. And this function is called the main function. But as you can see that we have void before the function name. And this will tell us that this function does not return any value. Okay. So the first thing we can know from this function is that this function does not return any value. And the second thing is that this function will be automatically executed by the GPU. So the GPU will search for each line looking for the main function. And once the GPU found that function, the GPU will automatically execute what is in it. Inside the main function, we have a variable. And that variable name is the GL position. And this variable contain the vertex location in the renderer coordinates. And that means that the GL position variable contains the final vertex position after it has been moved depending on the mesh position and the camera position. This part, which is vec4 position 1, contains the initial position for the vertex before it has been moved depending on the mesh and the camera position. And the initial vertex position contains four values. So that's why we used the vector 4. The first three values represent the vertex location on the x, y, and z. And the last value is the w, which is in 99% of cases will not need to be modified and will remain equal to 1. Briefly, they added the w value 
because we need to multiply the vertex position with these three matrices. These matrices are vector 4, so the vertex position must be a vector 4 so that we can multiply it with these matrices. Here we have mat4, which stands for matrix 4, and that means that a matrix consists of 4 rows and 4 columns. Okay, so in the vertex shader, we must have the GL position variable, which is the variable that will locate the final position for each vertex depending on the mesh position and the camera position. We notice that next to the initial vertex position, we have three matrices, which are the model matrix, and the view matrix, and the projection matrix. And all of these three matrices will be prepared in the first three lines. So the first three lines in any vertex shader program, we must have these matrices. In the first line, the first matrix is the uniform mat4 model matrix. And in the second line, uniform mat4 view matrix. And in the third line, uniform mat4 projection matrix. And each of these three lines has a specific function of changing the location of the vertex. All of these matrices are of uniform type because each matrix will do a specific thing for all the vertices, which is mean that these matrices will be applied to all the vertices. And as we said, that these matrices are mat4, which is mean a matrix consists of four rows and four columns. Each matrix will do a specific function for each vertex. The first matrix, which is the model matrix, this matrix will move the vertex depending on the position, rotation, scale of the mesh. So if we move the mesh on the X is equal to positive 1, then the vertex will be moved 1 to the right. And the second matrix, which is the view matrix. This matrix will move the vertex depending on the camera. So if we moved the camera on the X is equal to positive 1, then the camera will be moved 1 to the right, and that will move the vertex 1 to the left. So everything related to the camera details will be handled by the view matrix. And the last matrix, which is the projection matrix. So after we change the vertex position, depending on the mesh position and the camera position, we have to move the vertex from the local space to the clip space. You can imagine the local space as a place where the vertices will be moved depending on the mesh position and the camera position. Then after the vertex got its final position, we need to move the vertex from the experiment place, which is known as the local space, to the clip space in the screen coordinates. These three matrices will be prepared first, so that we will apply the matrices when the vertices position comes, and the position of the vertices is entered through this line of code. This line contains the first data we send to the vertex shader program, and the data name is position and the position data contain the position of the vertex, and it is the same position attribute in the geometry. And since each vertex has a different position from the other vertices, then we have to send the position data to the vertex shader program under what we call attribute. And since each vertex has a position on the X, Y, and Z, then this data type is a vector three. So this is why we send the position attribute to the vertex shader program in this formula, which is attribute vec3 position. Okay, now let's back to the GL position variable, which is as we said that it is a variable containing the final position of the vertex. Assume we have four vertices and we send the position of these vertices to this vertex shader program by writing this line of code. Then the first vertex will go inside the main function through the position variable. Currently, the position variable is a vector 3 contains the position of the vertex on the x, y, and z. Then a fourth value will be added to this vector 3 so that we can multiply the position with the other matrices. Assume that we have moved the mesh on the x by a value of positive 1, then the model matrix structure will change depending on the mesh details. We don't care what will happen inside the matrix, all we care about is that this matrix will add 1 to the vertex X position. Multiplication of two matrices will add two values together, and this principle is only in the matrices. Okay, also assume that we want to move the camera on the Z by a value 
of positive 2 and on the y by a value of 1. So 2 will be subtracted from the position of the vertex on the z and 1 will be subtracted from the position of the vertex on the y. But why did we do the opposite in the camera? We said that we want to move the camera on the z by a value of positive 2 and on the y by a value of positive 1. Why did we subtract a value instead of adding a value? Let's take the second line which is moving the camera by a value of positive 1 on the y-axis. So when we move the camera up, the vertex will move down. So that's why we do the opposite only in the details coming from the camera. These matrices are more complex than this, but this is how they work in general. And you will see in the upcoming lessons that you don't have to understand all of this. Okay, now all of this information will be saved inside the matrices. Currently, the vertex position got no change. The first change in the vertex position will start after the first multiply operation with the matrices. And as we said, that the multiplication in the matrices will apply the matrix, will add the matrix to the vertex position. So in this part, the vertex position will change depending on the details coming from the mesh. The only detail we have from the mesh is that the mesh moved on the x by a value of 1. So we need to add 1 to the x position of the vertex. Then the vertex position will be 0.5x, 0.5y, and 0z. Then the next matrix, which is the view matrix, will take the same vertex and apply the camera transformation on the vertex. We move the camera on the z by a distance equal to 2, so we have to subtract 2 from the vertex z position. And also we move the camera on the y by a distance equal to 1. Then we have to subtract 1 from the vertex y position. Then the final position of the vertex, after applying the view matrix, will be equal to 0.5x, negative 0.5y, and negative 2z. Then the last matrix will take the same vertex and move the vertex from the local space to the clip space screen coordinate. After finishing the first vertex, the second vertex will go through all of these stages, and then the third vertex, and so on, until there are no vertices left. So these were the three stages that each vertex will go through. The first one is applying the model matrix on the vertex. The second stage is applying the view matrix on the vertex. And the last stage is moving the vertex from the experiment place, which is known as the local space, to the clip space screen coordinate. Okay, let's now write the vertex shader code. First, we move to the vertex.glsl file, and then we start writing the three matrices, which are uniform, mat4, model matrix. As we said, that if you mistype any letter, or even forget the semicolon, we will have an error inside the console. So make sure that you don't forget the semicolon or mistype any letter. Okay, the second matrix is the view matrix. So we write uniform mat4 view matrix. And the last matrix is the projection matrix. So we write uniform mat4 projection matrix. Now since the vertex shader program is a program that will position the vertices on the screen coordinates. So we have to send the first data to this program, which is the position data. And we send the data by writing attribute vec3 position. Okay, now the last step is to create the main function, which is the function that will get automatically called by the GPU. We create that function by writing void main, and we open a curly bracket, GL position is equal to projection matrix, multiply view matrix, multiply model matrix, multiply vec4 position and 1. Okay, now if we open the console, we notice that we have a bunch of errors. And we got these errors because we didn't write the fragment shader program. So let me add it and we will explain it in a moment. After writing the two shader programs, the plane will look like this. Now if we move to the position and multiply it by 2, then the width and height will be also multiplied by 2. But how we got this result? Because each vertex position coordinates will be also multiplied by 2. 
So the vertex, which is located here, has a position equal to negative 0.5x, 0.5y, and 0z. So when we multiply the vertex position by 2, then the vertex position will be negative 1x, positive 1y, and 0z. And this vertex, after we multiply its position by 2, the position coordinate will be positive 1x, positive 1y, and 0z. So this vertex position on the x-axis is equal to negative 1. And this vertex position on the x-axis equal to positive 1. And the difference between the negative 1 and the positive 1 is equals 2. So the width value is equals 2. Previously, it was equals 1. And now it became equals 2. And the same will happen to the height. After we multiply the position by 2, the height value became equals 2. And of course, you can pause the video and track why we got this result. Okay, we also can move the vertices by moving the GL position variable. And that will be done by writing GL position dot x plus equal 1. So each vertex will be moved 1 to the right. Also, we can move the plane to the top by writing GL position dot y plus equal 1. All the vertices has been moved 1 to the top. Okay, let's now try and see what will happen when I remove one of the matrices. But before doing that, I want to move the mesh a distance equal to 1 on the y-axis. And now, when I remove the model matrix, we notice that the effect of moving the cube will not be applied to the vertices. And when I remove the view matrix, we notice that we no longer can see the mesh. And if you thought that we might have an errors inside the console, your doubts will completely disappear when I open the console. So this was a confirmation of the function of these matrices. Okay, let's return our matrices back. We have an abbreviation of writing the model and the view matrix. So we can write them in one line by writing uniform mat4 model view matrix. Then we have to change these matrices to the model view matrix. Now this matrix will do the model matrix function and the view matrix function. Okay, let's return everything as it was. Now to understand more, we want to write this line in such a way that we separate these matrices from each other. And that will be done by writing vec4 model position is equal to model matrix multiply vec4 position and 1. Now this line of code is responsible for moving the vertices depending on the mesh position. And then we write the second line which is vec4 view position is equal to view matrix multiply model position. So after we have moved the vertices depending on the mesh position, we want to move the vertices again depending on the camera position. And then we want to move the vertices from the local space to the clip space. And that will be done by writing vec4 projection position is equal to projection matrix multiply view position. And the last step is to equal the GL position to the projection position. After that, we will get the same result. Okay, now we have another way to move the mesh, which is by the model position. So if we write model position dot x plus equal 1, then the mesh will move 1 to the right. So when we separated the code like this, we got more control on these vertices. Okay, now since the position is a vector 3, we can save the position in a variable by writing vec3, and then you can name the variable with any name, and I want to name it copy position, and then we equal the variable with the attribute, which is the position. Now if I replaced the position with the copy position, then we will have the same result. And now, I want to change the vertices position on the y-axis by writing copy position dot y plus equal copy position dot y. Then we will get this result. Okay, 
let's understand why we got this shape. As we know that when the plane geometry has segments on the width equal to 1 and segments on the height also equal to 1, then the plane geometry will have 4 vertices. And we will apply the 3 matrices on each vertex of these 4 vertices. And we also apply everything we write inside the main function. So the first vertex position in the 3D space is negative 0.5x, positive 0.5y, and 0z. This vertex, when reaches line A, the first vertex position on the Y will change by adding a value to its position on the Y, and that value is equal to the vertex position on the Y. The first vertex position on the Y is equal to positive 0.5, and we want to add another positive 0.5 to the vertex position on the y. So the final value for the vertex position on the y-axis will be equal to positive 1. Thus, the final position for the first vertex is negative 0.5x, positive 1y, and 0z. After finishing positioning the first vertex, the second vertex will come and go through all of these stages. The second vertex position is positive 0.5x, positive 0.5y, and 0z. When the second vertex reaches line A, 0.5 will be added to the second vertex position on the Y. Thus, the final position for the second vertex will be positive 0.5x, positive 1y, and 0z. And the same thing will happen to the third vertex. The third vertex position on the Y is equal to negative 0.5. So, negative 0.5 plus negative 0.5 will be equal to negative 1. Thus, the final position for the third vertex is negative 0.5x, negative 1y, and 0z. The fourth and last vertex position is positive 0.5x, negative 0.5y, and 0z. After the fourth vertex reaches line A, the vertex position on the y will be negative 0.5 plus negative 0.5, which will be equal to negative 1. Thus, the final position for the fourth vertex is positive 0.5x, negative 1y, and 0z. And that will make the shape of the mesh looks like this, which is the same shape that we have here. This is how to follow the steps for any vertex shader program. We start from the first vertex and see if there are any changes to the first vertex position. Then we move to the second vertex, and then to the third vertex, and so on. Since we are beginners, we must follow these steps. But in the future, when you become proficient, you will be able to know the resulting shape before you even start writing the code. So this was the vertex shader. Now let's start with the fragment shader. So as we said, that the fragment shader program will color each visible pixel in the geometry. The base code for the fragment shader consists of a line of code and the main function. This main function will be executed after the main function in the vertex shader got executed. Okay, let's start with the first line, which is precision, medium P, float. This line will describe how you want the float to be precise. Meaning that, do you want the float precision to be height, or medium, or low? Usually we choose the medium P for the float precision. Cause if we choose the low P, we might have lack of a precision. And if you choose the high P, you might have a lack of performance. So that's why we are going with the middle option, which is the medium P. Okay, the second part of the fragment shader base code is the main function. The main function contains the GL frag color variable. The type of this variable is vector4. This variable is responsible for coloring the fragments. And since the GL frag color variable is a vector4, then the final color will consist of four colors, which are R from red, G from green, B from blue, A from alpha, which is the opacity. The RGBA values range from 0 to 1. 0 is the minimum value, and 1 is the maximum value. And as we used to do, which is, when we want to change the mesh opacity, 
then we have to change the transparency property to true. And since we are using the raw shader material, we can use some of the properties and the others we can't. Some of the properties that we can use are the wireframe property, the side property, and the transparent property. And one of the properties that we can't use is the color property, cause the color is controlled by the fragment shader. Okay, as we said that the fragment shader program consists of a line of code, and this line responsible for the floaty precision, and I choose the medium P. And the second thing we have in the fragment shader program is the main function, and this function contains the GL frag color variable, and the type of this variable is vector4. I give the variable a color equal to 1, 1, 1, and 1. Thus, the color will be white. If I change the values to 1, 0, 0, and 1, then the color will be red. Because I put in the red field the highest number, which is 1, and put a 0 in the green field and the blue field. If I change the blue value to 1, then we will have the purple color. We can also change the order of the colors by moving here and then write dot grba. And that will give us the green color, because I changed the order of the colors from the RGBA, which is the default, to the GRBA. So the first field became the green field instead of the red field. Okay, so this was the vertex shader and the fragment shader. We don't want to make the lesson longer than this, so we will continue in the next lesson. Today, we will talk about attributes. Till now, we only sent one data to the vertex shader, which is the position attribute. So we want to see what other attributes we can also send. In the geometry lesson, we learned that we can reach the attributes by printing the geometry in the console. Then we can see all the attributes that we have inside the geometry, which are the UV attribute, the position attribute, and the normal attribute. These attributes will be found in all the geometries. We also said in the geometry lesson that we can create a new attribute and then add it to the geometry as we will do later. But now we want to send the UV attribute in the same way we have sent the position attribute. Okay, since each vertex has different UV coordinates, that will tell us that the UV coordinate is an attribute data. So to send the UV coordinate to the vertex shader program, First, we have to write attribute, and since each vertex has two values in the UV coordinates, so we have to write vec2. And the last thing, we write the data name, which is UV. So now, we have sent the UV data to the vertex shader. And now, we want to use this data to change the vertices position. So the vertices position got changed, and that will make the vertices move in this direction. Inside this parentheses, we must have four values since the vector is a vector 4. The first two values comes from the UV, and then we give the vertices position on the Z a value equal to 0, and the W value equal to 1. Okay, now we want to send the position data and the UV data to the fragment shader. And since these data are attribute data, so we have to send them as varying data. And that will be done by writing varying and the first data I want to send is the position. So we write vec3. And then we must give the attribute a name. And that name will refer to the position data in the fragment shader. I would like to start naming the varying data with the letter v, then underscore, and then writing the data name, which is position. And we do the same to the uv by writing varying vec2 vuv. And then we move inside the main function and send the data by writing v position is equal to position. And in the same way, we send the uv by writing vuv is equal to uv. So now we have sent the position attribute and the uv attribute to the fragment shader. And now we have to receive this data from inside the fragment shader. And that's going to be done by writing varying vec3 v position. 
and varying vec2 vuv. So now we have access to use the position data and the uv data in the fragment shader. And now we can use the v position variable instead of three fields inside the gl frag color variable. We can use the vuv instead of two fields in the frag color. We also can use the VUV instead of one field, and that will be done by writing VUV.x. Then the mesh will look like this. Okay, now let's understand how we got this result. First, we have put the VUV.x in the green field, so the green field of the vertex will change depending on the XUV value for the vertex. So we open the console and we move to the UV, each vertex has two UV values. The first vertex UV values are 0 and 1. Here we wrote VUV.x, so we want the first UV value, which is 0. And to know the vertex color, which is located here, we replace this part with 0, and that will give us the purple color. So the first vertex color is purple. And in the same way, we go and see what is the second vertex color, which is located here. And the x value for the second vertex is 1. So we write here 1. And that will give us the white color. So when the value is 0, we will get the purple color. And when the value is 1, we will get the white color. Okay, let's see the third vertex color, which is located here. The x value for the third vertex is 0. So the third vertex color is purple. And the fourth and last vertex, which is located here, has an x value equal to 1. So the fourth vertex color is white. So the colors are purple here, white here, purple here, and white here. And with the color interpolation that happens between each separator, then in the end, the mesh will be colored like this. Okay, so this is how we send data to the vertex and the fragment shader. And now, we want to create our own data and then send it to the vertex and the fragment shader. We create data in the same way we have created the triangle in the geometry lesson, which is by creating a float 32 array, then we fill the array with some values. And then we tell the geometry that we want the values inside the array to be an attribute. So the first thing we have done in the geometry lesson is to decide how many values do we want inside the array. And the number of values should be the same as the number of vertices. So first, I want to create a variable. And we can know the number of vertices that any geometry have in the count, whether in the position count, or in the UV count, or in the normal count. And even if I increase the value of the segments, the number of vertices will be the same in any attribute count. Okay, we get the vertices number by writing geometry.attributes, and then we choose any attribute, for example, the position.count. The second step is to create the array by writing constant a new attribute array is equal to a new flow 32 array. And inside the parentheses, we write amount, and that will make the number of slots in the array to be the same as the vertices count. And now, I want to loop with the same slots number in the array. And in each iterate, I want to save in the array i modulus number 2. And the last step is to add the new attribute to the geometry attributes by writing geometry dot set attribute then we have to give the attribute a name now since each vertex has a different value from the other vertices then i prefer to start the name with the letter a which is an abbreviation of the attribute underscore and i want to name the attribute modulus then we have to write a new three dot buffer attribute a new attributes array and i want each vertex to get one value so we have to write one now if we move to the attributes, we notice that we have a new attribute, which is the A modulus attribute. 
with the same values that we have specified. Now we want to send the data to the vertex shader program by writing attribute and since each vertex has a one value then we write float and then we write the attribute name as we name it which is a modulus. We can use this data by changing the vertices position on the x axis by writing model position dot x plus equal which is mean that I want to add another value to the vertex x position and that value is the a modulus and that will give us this shape. And in the same way, we can move the vertices on the Y. And that will give us this shape. Let's also do the same on the Z. We can conclude from that, that we can put in the data values so that we can have the shape that we want. Okay. Let's remove these two lines. And I want to decrease the Z value by multiplying by 0.1. Okay. Now we want to color the geometry by using the A modulus attribute. So we have to send the data as varying data. So we write varying float VA modulus. Then we move down here and write VA modulus is equal to A modulus. And in the fragment, we write varying float VA modulus. Then we replace one of these values with the VA modulus variable. And that will color the mesh like this. Okay, now we can try something else and see what shape are you going to have. We try the modulus and now we want to try the random values. And that will give us this shape. Usually the game developers use this shape for mountain simulation. Of course the mountain will not look like this, but this is the idea in general. So that was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we will learn how we can animate the vertices. Till now, all we can do is to change the shape or the color of the mesh. But today, we want to have a continuous change in the shape and the color of the mesh, which is by using the uniform data. So first, we want to change the shape of the mesh and then animate the mesh. And as we know that the place responsible for changing the shape of the mesh is the vertex shader. So we want to move inside the main function and we want to change the vertices position on the Z axis by writing model position dot Z. As we know that the sign function will make the values range from negative one to positive one, depending on the value that I pass inside the sign function. And I want that value to be the vertex position on the X axis. So we write plus equal sign model position dot X. So this line will add a value on the vertex position on the Z and that value is the sign of the vertex position on the X. We can increase the amount of this value by multiplying it with a number, for example, 12. And that will make the mesh oscillate and make it looks like the sine function or looks like a wave. Okay, we can't see the mesh from the back side. So let me change the side property to double side. Okay, now we can control the wavelength either by increasing or decreasing. If we want to increase the wavelength, then we have to multiply it with a number higher than 1, for example, 2. And that will make the wavelength increases. And in the same way, if we want to decrease the wavelength, then we have to multiply it with a number lower than 1, for example, 0.15. Okay, 
Now to make this mesh animate, we have to send a uniform data to the vertex shader and that data must change continuously so that we can have animation. And then, when we put this data inside the sign function, we will have the animation. Okay, to create the uniform data, first, we have to move to the raw shader material and then write uniforms. The uniforms property allows us to create the uniform data. Then we create an object and inside this object, we give the uniform a name and I want to name it U amplitude. And then we give a value to this data by creating an object and then we have to write value. And then we give a value to this data, for example, 12. So now we have created a uniform data and that data name is U amplitude and its value is equal to 12. Now inside the vertex shader, we have to receive the data by writing uniform float. We wrote a float because it is one value. So we have to write float. And then we write the data name, which is U amplitude. And now we can use the uniform data instead of the static value that we have put. And that will give us the same result. But now we can control the amplitude value from inside the JavaScript file. Now in the same way, we want to create another data and this data will do the animation. Also, this data will be linked to the time. So I will call it U time. And the initial value for this data is zero. Now we want to change the U time value from inside the animate function. So first, we have to create a new section and I will name the section update U time. Now I want to link the U time value to the number of seconds that have passed since the project started. And as we know that this time is the elapsed time. We can reach the U time value by writing material dot uniforms dot U time dot value is equal to elapsed time. Now inside the vertex shader, I want to receive the U time by writing uniform float U time. And now we want to add the U time inside the sign function and that will make the mesh do this wavy animation. Currently, we are moving the vertices on the Z axis. We can change the vertices moving from the Z to Y by replacing the Z to Y. And that will make the vertices move on the Y axis. Okay, so this was about sending the uniform to the vertex shader. Now we want to send the uniform data to the fragment shader. So first, we want to create a new data and I want to name it U color. And the value will be new 3 dot color. Then we have to specify the color. This line will be converted internally to RGB value. Now inside the fragment shader, we receive the data by writing uniform vec3 u color. Then we replace the first three fields with the u color. So the mesh will be colored with the same colors that we specified in the u color data. Okay, now we want to change the mesh color depending on the time that has passed. So we want to create another uniform data and I want to name the data u time color. And we give it a value equal to zero. And inside the animate function, we want to link the u time color value with the time. And that will be done by writing material dot uniforms dot u time color dot value is equal to elapsed time. And in the fragment, we write uniform float u time color. Now let's return the frag color variable as it was. And now I want to change the RGB values for the frag color variable by writing gl frag color dot r is equal to sign u time. And the same thing we do for the green. And the last thing for the blue. Now the sign will make the values range from positive one to negative one and any value below zero will be zero. So first, the mesh will be white for 3.14 seconds. 
and then the mesh color will turn to black for 3.14 seconds. And we have a lot of choices in order not to have a value below zero. For example, here we add one, and here we change the sign to cosine, and here we make the sign negative. And this will make the mesh colored with different colors depending on the time. Okay, now we want to do another example, which is changing the mesh color depending on the mouse move. And to do that, first, we want to create an event listener for the mouse. Then we save the mouse moving on the X and the Y inside a vector to uniform data. And the last thing is to send this data to the fragment shader. Okay, so let's create the event listener. Here we want to create the cursor section. And here we want to create the cursor object. And then we instantiate the event listener. And the event that I want to listen to is the mouse move. And then we write cursor.x is equal to e.clientx divided by window.inner width. And cursor.y is equal to e.clienty divided by window.inner height. Now, when I move my mouse, the values inside the cursor object will range from 0 to 1 on the x and the y. And in the uniforms, I want to create a new uniform data and name it U cursor color. And the value is in U 3.vector2 cursor.x and cursor.y. And that will save the mouse movements inside the U cursor color variable. Now I want to link the mouse movement on the x-axis, which is saved inside the cursor object, to the x value in the vector2. And that will be done by moving inside the animate function and then write material.uniforms.ucursorColor.value.x. In this formula, we reached the first value inside the vector2. And now we want to equal it to the cursor.x. And we do the same on the Y. And now, on each frame, the mouse movement will be tracked and then saved in the U cursor color variable. Now inside the fragment, we want to receive that data by writing uniform vec2 U cursor color. Let's comment out this part and then change the red value to u cursor color dot x and it changed the green value to u cursor color dot y. So now, each time I move the mouse, the mesh color will also be changed. So these are some of the examples that will make you understand the shaders more. So that was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. Today, we are going to talk about the built-in functions that are in GLSL. But before we introduce the functions, let's remember how the vertices are distributed to form the geometry. Assume that we have this line of code. As you can see, that this line will describe the geometry, that this geometry is a plane geometry and has a width and height equal to 1. And the value of the segments are also equal to 1 for the height and the width. And with the material and the mesh, then we will have a plane mesh, and this mesh has a width and height equal to 1, and consists of 4 vertices. And the question is, does these vertices distribute randomly, or is there a certain way for distributing the vertices? And the answer is that, these vertices are distributed in such a way that the first vertex will be in the top left, and then this vertex will get a position depending on how far the vertex is from the center. If the mesh has a width and height equal to 1, then the first vertex position is negative 0.5x, 0.5y, and 0z. And then we move in this direction to the right, and the first vertex we encounter will get a position, and this vertex will be the second vertex. After we finish the first line, we move down and start from the first vertex on the left. And this vertex will get a position depending on how far it is from the center. And this vertex will be the third vertex. We also continue moving to the right, and the first vertex we encounter will get a position. 
assume that we have changed the value of the segments on the height and the width and made it equal to. Then a line will be drawn in the middle of the geometry width and that will divide the width into two parts. And the same will happen to the height and that will increase the number of vertices and this will give us nine vertices. And in the same order we talked about, the vertices will get a position. So we will start from the first vertex, which is located in the top left, and this vertex will get a position. Then we move to the right, and we found another vertex, so this vertex will get a position. After finishing giving the second vertex a position, we will continue moving to the right to see if we have vertices left. We found another vertex, then this vertex will be the third vertex, and also gets a position. Now we don't have any vertices left in the first line, then we move to the second line, and start from the first left vertex, and then move to the right, and each vertex we encounter will get a position. After there are no vertices left in the second line, we move down to the third line, and the same will happen to the vertices in the third line. So this is how the vertices will get a position in the geometry. After all the vertices get a position, the UV coordinate term comes. And now, we have to give all the vertices a UV value. So the same mesh will be put on imaginary coordinates, and the highest value for the x-axis is 1, and the highest value for the y-axis is also 1. And with the same vertices order, the vertices will get UV values depending on this UV axis. This is the first vertex that will get a UV coordinates, this is the second vertex, this is the third vertex, and this is the last vertex. And now, each vertex has a position and UV. And the last thing is the normal attribute. Each vertex will get a normal attribute in the same order that we mentioned. We have reviewed what we said in the previous lessons to focus on one thing, which is that the vertices are placed in the geometry in an orderly manner, and that will help us to guess the vertices' position when I change their position in the vertex shader, and also help us to guess the new color that the mesh will get after we change the vertices' color in the fragment shader. Okay, the GLSL language is just like any language, by having built-in functions. Of course, we can write the built-in functions manually, but when we use the built-in functions, we will save time writing the code, and also decrease the amount of written code. So here I copy the UV coordinates, and save them inside a variable. And then I write an if condition here, saying that, in case the UV value on the X is below 0.5, I want the UV value dot X to be equal 0. Else, I want the vertex value on the X to be 1. And then I used the copy UV variable, to color the geometry, and that will make the mesh color looks like this. If we used one of the built-in functions, we can save us writing all of these codes by using one of the built-in functions, which is the step function. So if I write float copy uvx step vuv.x and 0.5, and here we put the variable and the uv on the y and that will give us the same result. So we use the built-in function in order to save us time. Okay, now let's see what built-in functions do we have. And let's start with the sign function. The sign function will return a value between the negative one to positive one. And the cosine function will also return a value between the positive one to negative one. But the cosine function will start from positive one, and the sine function will start from zero. We also have the tan function, which is the result of dividing the sine by the cosine. The fourth function, which is the absolute function. This function will always return the positive value of the number. So, absolute negative one will be equal to one, and absolute negative 0.5 will be equal to positive 0.5. The next function is the minimum function. This function will return the minimum value. So min 1 and 0.7, the return value will be 0.7. We have an opposite function of the min function, which is the max function. This function will return the maximum value. So max 0.7 and 0.9, the return value will be 0.9. The next function 
is the round function. The round function will round the number. If the number is below 0.5, then the return value will be 0. And if the value is higher than 0.5, then the return value will be 1. So, round 0.4 will be equal 0, and round 0.51 will be equal 1. The floor function will only see the number on the left of the comma. So floor 0.999 is equal to 0, and floor 1.99 is equal 1. The next function is the seal function. In the seal function, if there is any number on the right of the comma, then 1 will be added to the number. So seal 1.001 is equal to, and seal 1.99 is also equal to. Okay, usually you heard of all of these functions, now let's continue and see what other functions we have. The next function is the mix function. Usually the mix function is used in the fragment, so that we can have a color gradation in the mesh, just like the color gradation in the CSS. So for example, to color the mesh with these colors, which are blue and green, we have to use the mix function. The mix function accepts three things. The first thing, which is the x value. The second thing, which is the y value. And the last thing, which is the mixing ratio. The x and y can be an integer, float, vector2, vector3, or vector4. And the n value must be within 0 and 1. If the n value is equal to 0, then the return value will be the x. And if the n value is equal to 1, then the return value will be the y. And if the n value is between the x and the y, then the return value will be depend on this equation, which is x multiply 1 minus n plus y multiply by n. Assume that we have this plane mesh, and we want to use the next function, to color the plane mesh, we wrote in the first field in the mix function, which is the x field, a vector 3, 0, 0, 1. And depending on the RGB values, this vector represents the blue color. And in the second field, which is the y field, we write vec 3, 0, 1, 0. And this vector represents the green color. And in the n field, we wrote vuv.x. So depending on the x value for the uv coordinate of the vertex, the color will be determined. If the n value is 0, then the return value will be the x, which is the blue color. And if the n value is 1, then the return value will be the y, which is the green color. And these are the uv values for all the vertices. I bring them by writing console.log geometry.attributes.uv.array. Each two values represent the position of the vertex on the UV coordinates. So the first two values are the X and Y for the first vertex, and the next two values are the X and Y for the second vertex, then the next two values are the X and the Y for the third vertex, and the last two values are the X and Y for the last vertex. And as we said, that the vertices will be ordered in the geometry like this. Now the n value is the value responsible for deciding the fragment color. And the n value is vuv.x. So we only care about the x or the first value in the uv for each vertex. The x value for the first vertex is 0, so the color will be blue. And the x value for the second vertex is 1, so the color will be green. The x value for the third vertex is 0, so the color will be blue. And the x value for the fourth vertex is 1, so the color will be green. And thus, the mesh will be colored like this. Okay, if we move to the fragment, this is how we write everything we talked about. First, we should write vector 3, cause the values that we are dealing with is a vector 3. Thus, the return value will be a vector 3. Then, we give the x value a blue color, and then we give the y value a green color. And then we give the n value, or the mixing ratio, a value equal to vuv.x. And the last thing, 
we should replace the first three fields in the glfrac color variable with the mixing variable. As we said that the in value is the value responsible for deciding the fragment color, and the in value will be depending on this equation. So if the in value equals 1, then the equation will be like this. 1 minus 1 equals 0, then this part will be 0. And thus, the n value will be y. And that's why we said, when the n value equals 1, then the return value will be y, which is the second value we write in the mix function. Okay. If the n value equals 0, then the equation will be like this. y multiplied by 0 equals 0. And x multiply 1 equals x. And thus, the n value will be x. So that's why we said that when the n value equals 0, then the return value will be x, which is the first value we write in the mix function. Okay, now if the n value equals 0.5, then the equation will be like this. 1 minus 0.5 will be equal 0.5, so this part is equal to 0.5x, and this part equal to 0.5y. Now the x value depending on the previous example is a vector 3, 0, 0, 1. So when we multiply a number with a vector, then we have to multiply that number with each field in the vector. So the final value for the x vector when we multiply it by 0.5 will be equal to vec 3, 0, 0, 0.5. And the same thing will happen to the y. The y value is equal to 0, 1, 0. So when the y is multiplied by 0.5, the y value will be 0, 0.5, and 0. The addition operation in vectors will be by adding the x value for the first vector with the x value for the second vector, the y value for the first vector with the y value for the second vector, and the z value for the first vector with the z value for the second vector. And thus, the mixing ratio will be a vector 3, 0, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5. And this vector will color the vertices with two colors, which are the green and the blue. And that will make the mesh look like this. If we try that on the plane by changing the n value to 0 0.5, then we will have the same result. Now each time I decrease the n value, the value will get closer to zero, and that will make the color go toward the blue. And each time I increase the n value, then the n value will get closer to the one, and that will make the mesh color goes toward the green color. Okay, so this is the mix function, and let's see the next function, which is the clamp function. Assume that you will do an exam, and your mark in this exam will be between zero and hundred. So if your answer was so annoying and your teacher gave you negative 10, the teacher in the end will write your grade in his grade book as zero. And even if you write amazing answers and your teacher gives you 200, then in the end, the teacher will write your grade in his grade book 100. And if you get a mark between zero and 100, then the teacher will write your mark in his grade book as it was. And this is the same principle as how the clamp function work. The clamp function accepts three things. The x, which is your mark in the exam. The min, which is the lowest value you can get. And the max, which is the highest value you can get. The clamp function allows us to restrict the values between the maximum value and the minimum value. So any value below the minimum value, the return value will be the minimum value. And any value higher than the maximum value, the return value will be the maximum value. And if the value between the minimum and the maximum, then the value will return with no change. So clamp negative 3, 0, and 1, the return value will be 0. And clamp 12, 0, and 1, the return value will be 1. And clamp 0.2, 0, and 1, the return value will be 0.2. Okay, I have created the color variable and used it to color the mesh. So if I want to change the red value for the color variable, then we have to write color dot r is equal to clamp v u v dot y zero and one. 
and if we want to change the green value for the color variable, then we have to write color dot g is equal to clamp vuv dot x zero and one. And if we want to change the blue value for the color variable, then we have to write color dot b is equal to clamp vuv dot x zero and one. And that will color the mesh like this. Of course, you can pause the video and track each vertex so that you can know how we get this result. Okay, the next function is the step function. The step function accepts two things. If the x is greater than the y, then the return value will be zero. And if the y is greater or equal to x, then the return value will be one. So the return value from the step function is either zero or one. And that's why we can't have a color interpolation when we used the step function to color the mesh. Okay, let's use the step function to change the red value by writing color.r is equal to step 0 v position dot x. And let's also change the green value by writing color.g is equal to step 0 v position dot y. And that will color the mesh with four different colors without having any color interpolation or color mixing between the separators. Because as we said, that the step function will return only zero or one. Okay, the next function is the smooth step. The smooth step is similar to the step function. But in the smooth step, we will have an interpolation between the two values and the return value will be a smooth interpolation, which is mean that we will have a color mixing. The smooth step accepts three things. If the x value is greater than the n value, then the return value will be zero. And if the n value is greater than the y value, then the return value will be one. And if the n value is between the x and y values, then the return value will depend on this equation. So if we changed the function to smooth step and then add the y value, we notice that each time I increase the y value, the color mixing will appear more clearly. And this interpolation will be depending on that scary equation. And as I keep saying that you can pause the video and track the color on each vertex so that you can make sure that everything is clear to you. Okay. The next function is the modulus function. The modulus function, or the remainder, is the remaining value after the division operation. So we notice in the first example that the modulus value equals zero, and in the second example, the modulus value equals one. In the third example, the modulus value equals zero, and in the fourth example, the modulus value equal one. And each time the number increases, the modulus value will be between zero and one we can express the remainder of the division in this figure so that its value is zero and then it gradually increases to a certain value. And this value we determine in advance. Assume that the value is one, then the remainder of the division value will start from zero and then start gradually increases until it reaches one and then it drop instantly to zero. And then we'll do the same, which is by increasing from zero and gradually increases to one, then it drop to zero and so on. In JavaScript, we can get the modulus by using the symbol. But in GLSL, we can get the modulus by using the mod function. So first, write mod. The mod function accepts two things. The first thing is the number that we want to divide. And the second thing is the limit value, which is the number one that we saw in the example. So when the number reaches the limit, the value will instantly drop to zero. Okay, now I want to write in the field number vuv.y multiply by five. And I want the limit to be one. And then we replace the first three fields with the mod variable. Now as you can see that we wrote in the number field vuv.y. And as we know that the uv values range from zero to one. So when we multiply it by five, the values became range from zero to five. And in the limit field, we write one. So when the UV value on the Y reach one, the value will instantly drop to zero. 
and that will color the mesh like this. First, the value will start from zero, meaning the color is black, and then the value will gradually start increasing until the value reaches the limit. In this case, the limit is one. So when the value reaches one, a break for the value will happen and reset the value back to zero. And that will keep happening all over the mesh. Okay, the next function is the length function. The length function will give us the vector length. As you can see in this example, this vector has a value on the x and a value on the y. So this vector is a vector two and its value on the x equals one and its value on the y is also equals one. If we want to know the vector 2 length mathematically, then we have to write x square plus y square under the root. So 1 square plus 1 square is equal to 2, and 2 under the root is equal to 1.4142. So 1.4142 is the length of this vector. If the vector is a vector 3, then the vector will have 3 values, and the length for this vector will be x square plus y square plus z square and all of these values will be under the root. In GLSL we have a function that will calculate the vector length and the function name is length. So if you want to know the vector length and then save it inside the variable then we have to write float vector length. But why we used the float? Because the vector length will be a float number even if we used the vector 2 or vector 3 or vector 4, the return value will be a float number. And then we write length vec2 0.4 and 0.3. And thus, this vector length will be 0.5. If we use this value to change the red value for the frag color variable, then we will have this result, which is the same result when we change the red value to 0.5. Okay, the next function is the distance function. The distance function will calculate the distance between two points. So if you want to change the mesh color, depending on how far each vertex from the center of the mesh, then we have to write float distance, then we use the distance function, and then we specify the two points that we want to calculate the distance between them. I want the first point to be the vertex position on the UV, so we have to write VUV. And the second point is the plane center, which will be a vector 2. Because each point in the plane is a vector 2 since the plane has no depth, which is mean that we can specify any vertex location for the plane by two values, which are the X and Y values. So the plane center coordinate will be a vector 2, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 and then we will use the variable in the RGB fields. We notice that the far away the vertex is from the center of the mesh, the distance will be larger, and that will make the vertex color get closer to the white color. And when the vertex is close to the center of the mesh, the distance value will be smaller, and that will make the vertex color get close to the black color. Okay. I don't have to tell you that we can use these functions in the vertex shader. So for example, if you want to move the vertices depending on how far the vertex is from the center, then we have to write model position and I want to move the vertices on the z-axis. Plus equal distance uv vec2 0.5. Let me increase the number of vertices and also change the side property to double side so that we can see the mesh from the front and from the back. And also change the wireframe property to true and that will make the vertices move a larger distance on the Z depending on how the vertex is far away from the center. And that will make the mesh look like this. So these were the most built-in functions that you might use in GLSL. Now, did we study all the functions? Of course not. We have more than a thousand functions and we can find these functions by going to Google and write GLSL built-in functions. And then we choose the built-in functions GLSL OpenGL and this website created by the Kronos group. And then we click here. 
Here you can find all the functions in this language and they also explain how to use the function. So if we click on the length function, we notice that they are explaining to us how to use this function. And they also provide us the functions similar to the length function, such as the distance function. So in case you encounter a function and you didn't know how the function works, then you can come here and see how the function works. So that was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about the noises function. The noises function will make the shaders more realistic. Okay, but what does that mean? If we take a look at a natural views images, we notice that the image is too perfect. But in reality, any element will have a lot of scratches and bumps, especially in stones or wood. So that's why we want to make the scene more random, and that will make the scene more realistic. And that will be done by using the noises function. We can do many scenes using the noises function, such as cloud scene, or fire, or stone surface, and we also can do a wood surface. All of these scenes will be done by modifying the values in a random way. Okay, the simplest noise function is the random function. We notice in this example, first, I wrote the random function, and this is how we write the random function. Because unfortunately, we don't have a built-in random function in the GLSL, meaning that we don't have a function similar to the math.random in JavaScript. We notice that the random function accepts a vector 2, and that's why I passed the UV, because the UV is a vector 2. Then we multiplied the random function with a vector 3, and inside the vector 3, we have the number 1, and that will make the values range from 0 to 1. If I decreased the value inside the vector 3 to 0.2, then the color values will range from 0 to 0.2 and that will color the mesh like this. We have a lot of noises function, and each noise function will do some pattern. And to see the noises function that we have in the GLSL, we move to Google, and then write GLSL noises. And then we click on the GitHub link, which has the title GLSL noise algorithms. These are most of the noises function that we have. We have the two dimension noise function, we also have the 3D noise function, and if we scroll down, we can see that we have the 4D noise function. Okay, let's try one of these functions. For example, let's try the simplex 2D noise. We copy the function like this, and we put it above the main function. We notice that this function returns a float value. So if you want to use this function, then we have to start the variable with a float. Then we give it a name, for example, simple x. And now, we want to use the function. Then we write the function name as it is named here. We notice that this function accepts a vec2 value. So we have to write a vec2 inside of it, such as the uv coordinates. So we write vuv. Now since the return value is a float, then we have to write the variable in the frag color variable three times. Or we can write that in another way, which is by writing vec3 and then writing the variable name in the vector3, and that will give us the same result. Okay, I want to write the variable three times in the frag color variable, so that I can change the RGB values with these. Okay. Now each time we multiply the noise function with a number less than 1, then the color will tend to be more simple. For example, we can get this result by writing plot simple xx is equal to vuv dot y multiply by 0.5. And then we replace the three fields with the variable. And that will give us the same result. So we notice that each time I multiply the noise function with a number less than 1, the result will tend to be simple. And we can get that result without the need to use the noise function. But when I multiply the noise function with a number higher than 1, the result will be more complex. And it is hard to get this result without using the noise function. Okay, 
Now we want to add uniform data so that we can have an animation. So we move inside the row shader material and then we write uniforms and I want to name the data uTime and give it an initial value equal to zero. And in the animate function, we write material.uniforms.uTime.value is equal to elapsed time. And in the fragment, we receive the uTime. And now, if I added the uTime to the uV, then the plane will start animating like this. We also can change the colors grades from here. We can also modify the simple X noise in order to have another shape. For example, if I wrote here 0.5 plus clamp S noise VUV multiply 20 plus U time 0 and 1. And that will color the mesh like this. Okay. One of the websites that will give you an idea of the things you can do with the shaders is theshadertoy.com. This site shows you many designs that were designed using shaders. Here we notice that all of this code is a GLSL code. And in the search bar, you can search for a specific thing such as clouds. And then choose the design that you like the most. So you can visit this website to get an idea of how a design has been done. So that was everything for today and see you in the next lesson. Our lesson for today is how we can add texture on the mesh using shaders. And as we said in the texture lesson, which is if we want to use an image as a texture, we have to use the texture loader. Okay, so let's instantiate the texture loader by writing constant texture loader is equal to a new 3 dot texture loader. And now I want to load the texture by writing constant texture is equal to texture loader dot load. Then we specify the texture location. The image that I want to use is inside the texture folder. Any image dimension must be divisible by 2 so that the GPU can handle any stretch or shrink that happens to the image. Okay, so let's add the image path which is located inside the texture folder. Now we want to send this texture to the fragment shader. So we move to the uniforms and we want to create a new uniform data and I want to name it uTexture. And the value will be the texture name. And now inside the fragment, I want to receive this data by writing uniform sampler 2D U texture. The sampler 2D is a special type for adding the texture as uniform data. Okay, now I want to color the mesh with the same colors that are in the texture, and that will be done by writing vec4. We used the vec4 because of the RGBA. So in case the texture has an opacity, then the opacity will appear on the mesh. Okay, then we give the variable a name. And to know what colors the texture have, then we have to use the texture 2D. And the texture 2D accepts two things. The first thing is the texture name. And the second thing is the plane UV coordinates. Because as we know that the UV is the coordinates used to know how the texture will look on the mesh. And the last step is to equal the frag color variable with the texture variable. Okay, but what do we benefit from texturing the mesh using shaders? And the answer is that currently we have more control on the image. To understand what I mean by that, we need to separate the texture colors from the opacity. And that will be done by writing vec3 color texture is equal to texture 2d u texture vuv dot rgb and in the frag color variable we write vec4 and the variable name then we add the opacity 
and now we can control the texture colors by changing the RGB order. So each time I change the RGB order, the colors on the texture will also be changed depending on the RGB order that we have put. And thus, we can have a new image depending on the RGB order that we specified. So in case I change the RGB to RRR, then we will have a grayscale image. Okay, so that was the first benefit we got from adding the texture on the mesh using shaders, which is as we said, that we can change the texture color with ease. And the second benefit is that we can change the texture position on the plane by changing the UV coordinates. As we know that the UV coordinates is the attribute responsible for specifying how the texture will look on the mesh. So when I change the UV coordinates values, then the texture position on the mesh will also be changed. So if I write vec2 in new UV is equal to vec2 vuv.x 1 minus vuv.y and we want to use the new UV instead of the vuv and that will rotate the texture upside down. The UV value on the X remains the same, but we subtracted one from the UV value on the Y, and that will reflect the image like this. If we subtracted one from the UV X values, then a reflection will happen on the X and on the Y. And that was everything for today, and see you in the next lesson. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about post-processing. The post-processing are filters written in GLSL and added to the final rendered image. We have a lot of effects or filters, and the filters will apply a specific effect depending on the written GLSL code. The way how the post-processing work is similar to any software that has filters, such as Photoshop software, and we can find these filters inside the Effect Composer class. The 3GS provide us with many effects that we can use, such as the glitch effect, or the pixelated effect, we also have the half tone RGB which will color the objects with the rainbow colors. We also have the God Ray effect. And many more effects that we can use in our project. And by using one of the effect composer, then you will do two renders. The first render is rendering the scene. And the second render is rendering the scene with the effect. So in this scene, this is the first scene that will be rendered. In this scene, we have a sphere. And I added an environment map on the sphere. And also used the environment map on the scene background. So as I was saying, that this is the first scene that will be rendered. And the second scene that will be rendered is the final scene, which is what shows on your screen right now. Okay. So as we said that the final render will be the scene which is the sphere and the environment map with the effect that you choose. Assume that this filter is what we choose, then the final render will look like this. Okay, now let's try some of the effects that we have. But before that, we have to import two things. The first thing is the effect composer and will be imported by writing import effect composer from Three examples JSM post processing effect composer. And the second thing is the render pass, which is the class used by the effect composer. This class will pass the effects and also will render the final image, just like the function of the renderer.render line. Okay, now let's import the render pass by writing import render pass from Three examples JSM post processing render pass. Okay, now let's instantiate the effect composer. So I want to create the effect composer section. 
and then write constant effect composer is equal to a new effect composer. And inside the parentheses, we write the renderer as we name it here. And we also copy these two lines and then pasted them here. And then change the renderer to effect composer and that will make the final image to be with the same pixel ratio and with the same size. Now the second step is to create the render pass by writing constant render pass is equal to a new render pass scene and camera. And then we specify the element that will pass the image, which is the render pass. So we write effect composer dot add pass render pass. But we still didn't change the rendered image inside the animate function. So we comment this part and we render the final image that comes from the effect composer by writing effect composer dot render. We don't have to write the scene and the camera as we did here because these elements will be written in the render pass. Okay, till now we have no change. But currently, the scene is being rendered through the effect composer. Okay, now we want to start importing the effects, and let's start with the first effect, which is the Unreal Bloom Pass. So we copy the render pass, and paste it here, and then change the render pass to Unreal Bloom Pass. And we also change the render pass here to Unreal Bloom Pass. Then let's create the Unreal Bloom Pass section, And then write constant Unreal Bloom Pass is equal to a new Unreal Bloom Pass. Then we add this effect or this pass to the effect composer by using the add pass method. And we write the pass as we name it here. And now we got the Unreal Bloom effect. But as you can see that we have to change some of the effect properties so that we can have a better scene. We have four properties that will make the Unreal Bloom effect better. The first one is the scene resolution, which is the scene dimensions. So we write in u3.vector2 window.innerwidth and window.innerheight. The second one is the intensity or the effect strength. So we can change its value by writing the value here or we can change the strength by writing Unreal Bloom Pass dot strength is equal to 0.35. The default value for the strength is 1, so if we want to decrease it, then you have to write a value less than 1. If you want to change the properties value from inside the parentheses, then you have to follow the order. The first field is for the resolution, the second field is for the strength, the third field is for the bloom radius. So we can reach the radius property by writing Unreal Bloom dot radius. We don't want to change the radius value, so I will equal it to zero. The fourth property is the threshold, which is how you want the element brightness so that it starts glowing. This property is just like a controller. Any brightness value above this limit will make the element start glowing and any brightness value below this limit will not make the element glow. So this is how the scene looked like before we used the bloom effect. And this is how the scene looked like when we used the bloom effect. Okay, we can add these properties in the GUI so that we can control them with these. So we write GUI.add Unreal Bloom Pass and we want to tweak the strength. We want the minimum value to be 0, and the maximum value to be 1, and the step value to be 0 0.001. Let's also add the threshold property to the GUI. Now each time we increase the threshold, we notice that the scene glow will decrease. Because in order for the elements in the scene to start glowing, this element's brightness must be above this number. 
and each time we start decreasing the threshold value, we also decrease the limit that will make the elements start glowing. Okay, now we also can add the enabled property in the GUI, and this property will control the appearance of the bloom effect. If we checked the box, then we will have the effect, and if we uncheck the box, the effect will not be applied. And of course, we can control the appearance of the bloom effect by using the enabled property. If we make the property value true, the effect will be applied. And if we change it to false, the effect will not be applied. Okay, so this was the bloom effect. And now let's see the next effect, which is the glitch effect. In the same way, we have imported the bloom pass, we can import the glitch pass. But all we have to do is to change the effect name to glitch pass. And we also have to change the glitch path. Now we move down here and create the glitch path section. And we also follow the steps that we have done to add the Unreal Bloom Pass. So I want to copy these lines and paste them here. Then we change the name and the pass to glitch pass. And here we write glitch pass, but we make the G letter capital. Then we will have the glitch pass effect. Okay, we can add multiple filters or passes to the scene. So if we check the box, then we will have two passes, which are the glitch pass and the Unreal Bloom pass. So in the normal 3GS scene, which is the scene without adding any pass, the renderer will render the scene directly on the screen. But in case we want to add three passes to the scene, then the scene will be changed three times before getting rendered on the screen. So when the renderer wants to render the scene, when the renderer on the way to render the scene on the screen, the renderer will notice that three passes must be added to the image before rendering it on the screen. So the first pass will be added to the final image, then the second pass will be added, and then the third pass. After there are no passes left, this image will be rendered on the screen. And this is the same thing that happened here. Here we have two passes, the bloom pass and the glitch pass. The first pass added to the final image is the bloom pass, and then the glitch pass. Okay. Now let's comment these passes and see the next pass, which is the dot screen pass. We import this pass just like we have imported the previous passes, but we have to change the pass name and the pass path. And then I want to copy the glitch pass and then paste it here. And here I write dot screen pass and change the class name and the constant name. This is how the dot screen pass looks like. 